I think we're all fascinated with escapes. I mean, I, I was, I'm fascinated with everything, but escapes, uh, when you think about it, um, you know, we, 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 we escape the womb. We start right at the beginning. We, 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 we're, we're, I guess, thrust into this world. So we escape one thing and thrust into another. And so we're always looking for ways to escape maybe a pejorative situation that we might be in or a, a bad marriage or whatever. We're always looking for ways out, you know, so we can identify with this. And speaking of which, I'm going to start with uh, something that might be a little entertaining for you folks. I love doing escapes. Uh, this is, I got a lot of magician friends. I need somebody to help me out on this. Um, George, get up here. <laughs> okay, I'll do all the hard work. You just have to lock me in here. My teacher's always okay. me too. Okay, <laughs> all right. Now I need you to hold that. Well, I yeah. actually, I'm gonna get you. Oh, get yeah, you, you, hold, you hold the lock. Okay. And, and actually what, what I want you to do, George, is take that chain and pull it around that wrist, up around that way, and put it down into that loop that's down in there. You see the loop? Yeah. You just put it down, feed it down through the loop. Yeah. Okay, and then bring it back up. Okay, now I want you, sir, to take the, ch the lock and lock it right into the, uh, yeah, but I need you to lock it right into the chain here. Yeah, right, yes, right into there. Th this, one this, this one right into there somewhere. There we go. How's that? Yes. Is it, is it locked in there as tight as you can get it? There we go. All right, there we go. Okay. Now, George, I need you to take, take your hand and try to put it down through the chain. See how tight that is? Between my wrist and the chain. Nope, there's no room there. Okay. All right. Okay. Very good. Don't go anywhere, George. Hold on. <laughs> I mean, this might not work. This might not work. Okay. I mean, you didn't run off the key, did you? Okay. Now, it takes concentration. Hold on. It's a little embarrassing. Hold on. Just work. Just work. Damn. I, I'm sorry. I can't get out. Can you can you get me out of this? It's not working. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Uh, before we get into this, I just want to tell you a little bit about the, how I got into the entertainment business because this is this was a form of escapism. What I do is a form of the the, the sculptures I build, the the entertainment I do. It's all a form of escapism, and and that's that's. Uh, uh, when you think about it, um, entertainment is, I mean, back in the 30s, some of the, some of the greatest movies ever, that, that ever came out, The Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind, they were, uh, people were going through the depression. They were looking for ways to escape their situations, and they went to these, these great movies. And so when I was young, um, I was trying to escape my situation, which, by the way, uh, when I was in fourth grade, they put me in this uh, class, which was called Guidance, and it was a slow learning class. I was in this class with people that were on borderline retarded, which you can't say that word anymore, but that was okay back then. So I was there with these kids, and I, I, I didn't feel like I really belonged. So I was looking for a way out. So I started imitating the, the characters that were on TV back then. That, that, it, you know, that always brought laughs. You know, like Deputy Barney Five. <laughs> you know, back in the black and white days, we didn't have any cell phones. We had cell numbers. We had cell number one and cell number two. <laughs> yeah. So I was doing that, getting laughs out of the kids. You know, and then there was a, you know, the, you know, the, the multimillionaire and Gilligan Island, isn't that right? Love you, dear. And I said, doing him. And let's see, you know, that old, that old guy on, on Green Acres, oh, Mr. Haney, he'd sell his own mother for two dollars. And then everybody's favorite, uh, everybody's favorite monster. <clears throat> uh, Eddie, uh, uh, Eddie, uh, uh, don't be late for school, Eddie. Uh, uh, goody, 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 goody. <laughs> hey, Hyman, I got an idiot for a son-in-law. Uh, those were the characters I was... <laughs> so an entertainer needed props. So I started making the props to go with the entertaining. And so you see where it ended up. But anyway, but, uh, you know, I, I was... 
I was, uh, you know, got a little older, and you know, I couldn't, didn't know where this was all going. You know, fast forward to 2012, I did a big art show down at the Taubman Museum of Art. It broke all attendance records. There was about 400 people there. I did a talk. I had to get over my nervousness to talk in front of 400 people, folks. I believe that. In the audience was my fourth grade teacher who had put me in that class. <laughs> I started talking to her a little bit, and I wanted to catch up with her after the thing. And you know, there was that—you know—the reception and the wine and all that stuff. And yeah, I looked around; she was gone. It took me four years to finally catch back up with her. Now, folks, what I'm about to tell you is—it might be hard to believe, but uh, for 43 years, I had carried the stigma with me. I thought I was stupid for 43 years because I was put in that slow learning class. After I caught back up with her, I had a conversation with her on the phone, and she said, I, I got comfortable enough to, to say, why, why was I put in this class? Was it because I was really that stupid? And she hesitated. She said, no, Mark. She said, is that what you believe? She said, I put you in that class because you were so far advanced above everybody artistically. I had to put you there to protect you. She was doing what a good teacher is supposed to do. But for 43 years, I thought I was stupid. You know what I was? I was the I was the scarecrow in the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> so anyway, so that's all a good thing. Uh, but I just wanted to tell you that story so you'd know where I was coming from. But I'm an adventurer, and this is, this is the direction I went, and I grew up, you know, a loving life. And when I hear about these, these people, these, these people that I'm getting ready to talk about tonight, they, they were ordinary people, but they were, they were thrust into these extraordinary circumstances. Um, let me start with, uh, oh, and by the way, as I tell you these stories, we're going to do a, a few demonstrations and a few things. And I'm going to tr try to correlate some of the things that, that uh, you know, some of my experiences uh, along with it. Um, but uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to try to bore you too long here, but let's see here. These guys, Peter Strelzik and Gunnar Wetzel. Uh, Peter, of course, they lived in... Uh, they lived in East Germany, and uh, <clears throat> they were looking for a way to escape. His sister brings over this magazine that shows hot air balloons, and so he's thinking, wow, what a way to go, you know, over on a hot air balloon. Well, the problem is, you're not just going to go over and buy a hot air balloon over in East Germany. <laughs> so he gets with his buddy, and they're, they're talking about this. Um, he gets some textbooks and shows how they built you know, how to build these hot air balloons. And so the information I read said basically that he got with his buddy, they built this hot air balloon, they went up on a hill uh, at midnight and, 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 and uh, after uh, two, two attempts, which were uh, failures, but they, the third one, they went up there in an untested balloon and they got their family in there and they took off and they landed in uh, West Germany. Well, that sounds pretty simple, but you think about this. Now you're over there in East Germany, and people are always watching. All the, 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 the government's watching you, and you're going to build a huge balloon without anybody knowing it. And you're going to do it two times, and, and it's not going to work out for you, so you're doing it a third time. I mean, and they couldn't just build it out in the open. They had to go in a room probably half this size and build a balloon that big and know what they were doing. These people had never built a balloon. They had never built anything like this before. They built it out of raincoats, sewing it together. Then you have to take that balloon. Then you're going to have to go up on the hill, the high hill, without being seen, never tested. This thing weighed several hundred pounds, if not a thousand pounds, where you have your whole family dragging this up on a hill in the middle of the night. And then, then you're d testing this thing that's never, you've never tested. This is the first time you're, you're doing this. And you light up the, the fire and you get your family down in it. And what a, I mean, just, just think of the nerve, just think of the, the risk. This thing lifted off and they weren't even sure which direction the air was going to take them. Okay. <laughs> so, they're in the air. And they're, the good news is they're above the spotlights, okay? Because they're using old World War II spotlights that, um, you know, they didn't have all the laser and stuff like that now, now that we got. But anyway, they're shining this up, and, and uh, about, about halfway over, I guess, they, the fuel ran out. 
the fuel ran out. And you know, when your fuel runs out, you're going to come down. You're going to start coming down slow at first, but then pretty quick. They crashed. Nobody was hurt, but they didn't know which side of the wall they'd landed on. And a policeman came up to him and said, "Das Welkman, West Deutschland." So they had made it. Harry Dedalin, he got with his stoker. He was a train engineer. He got with his stoker, and they kind of came up with this plan to take the train and go through the wall. Now, I, I don't know the details on this. I'm just, you know, because it was very sparse on some of the information. But apparently, he, he knew where the tracks were going, and he, it was his job to run the train and all that. And, and, and people never really questioned him. But uh, he put together this plan. Now, when I say he, he went through the he, he didn't actually go through the wall. He, um, he, he, he planned this thing. He, dis, dis, he took the brakes loose from, he disassembled the brakes. He got with uh, uh, his, his buddy there and they got all their friends and family. They, the, one report said 24 of them, the other said 32 of them. But they all got together and they, they, sped, they sped up the train and he wasn't even sure that the rails were still there because they were talking, there was rumors that they had taken them down. And so, can you, you know what it's like if you take a train full force and you run out of rail, folks? <laughs> it's not a very pleasant thing. But these, ha were, these were how desperate these people were. You know, we tend to forget. I mean, you know, you're desperate for your freedom from, from oppression. This is what you do. It was going full steam. And it was a barrier. Now, it wasn't the wall. So people think it was the wall. He went through the barrier. Okay, and busted right through it. The, the guards were so freaked out, they, were, they didn't even shoot. Because, you know, you see a train coming at you. <laughs> Folks, now I'm going to tell you a little bit about my experience, you know. Uh, there was a train tunnel in Waynesboro called the Crozet Tunnel. And I've gone through it several times. And, and was it me and you that went through it when, was it, it was, was you worth me that day? We went through the tunnel. I mean, you know, we went through the tunnel. And as you go through the tunnel, it's only it's so wide, but there's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a live, uh, uh, it's, it's a working train tunnel. And anyway, it's about a mile long. At the time it was built, it was the longest train tunnel in the, in the world back in the 1850s by uh, Claudius Crozet. Anyway, as you, we, 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 we kind of charted it out. As you go, every, about every 60 feet, there's like a little inset that hold, holds about four people. And so we thought, well, if a train does come, we'll just stand in there. And on the other side, it's about every 60 feet, it alternated. So we're going through. We're hearing that rumble, unmistakable rumble. We see the light hitting up the wall. We say, oh, oh my god, it's a train. We kept our cool. And all of us ran up to that little inset. Did I say it held four people? There were five of us. <laughs> I was the fifth one. But it was my brother and uh, some of his, uh, some of my nephews. But, but uh, fortunately, folks, I was able to suck it in. <laughs> but when you see a train coming at you and it was this close, it's terrifying. I could put my finger out and I could have actually touched the train. You know, I could see the compartments going past like this. But that's how terrifying that was. So uh, that's just my experience with that. Uh, let me see if I can go in the right direction this time. There we go. Horst Klein. I like his last name already. This guy was a circus performer, and his, uh, uh, he, he, he was told he couldn't perform anymore. They took his livelihood away from him. So he was living a dismal life then now in East Germany, but he's, he needed to escape. Anything was better than living out his life there. Well, being a circus performer, and this is the irony because he's looking at the electrical wires going across. He thinks that's not too much different than the wires he's, you know, he's a trapeze artist that he, he walks across. Except it is different. <laughs> because the ones he walks across don't have electricity going through them. <laughs> and besides that, there's, uh, the, 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 those are controlled, and the circus is controlled. He had never, you know, he'd sell these wires, and he had planned to go across them. And when he gets up there, he realizes, I mean, he, you, he, there's, there's uh, two different types of trapeze wires that you can go across. Some are real tight. Well, those definitely weren't tight. And then there's the wiggly kind. I don't know what they call that. But those wiggly kind only go about 12 feet, where they, they juggle on the wiggly kind. But this went to the first tower. It was about uh, 200 and, 
um, about 210 feet to the, to the next tower, in other words. Well, he, not only did he realize that he was in a bit of trouble, he thought, well, there's only one way I can get across, and that's hand over hand. And he realized the only way to do this is to get up and touch the, and to get to the wire, but he had to leap off the pole to get to the wire and not touch him at the same time, or he would have been toast. So now he's going hand over hand, and he's going about over the wall, which is where the other tower is. So and he's as quiet as a church mouth, and he's looking down and hoping that the guards aren't going to shine their lights up, because he's about 40 or 50 feet up. So he has to jump down off the wire, onto the tower, then get off that tower, jump up onto the other wire, and he goes about another 60 feet. Sounds easy if you're a circus performer, but I forgot to mention it was seven degrees. He was freezing. And like I said, he didn't have any gloves. He was freezing. He had a rope around his neck. He took that rope and tied it around the wire and started lowering himself down. And his hands were so numb, he couldn't hold on to it. He fell 40 feet, knocked him out for three hours. When he woke up, a lady found him. He had two broken arms. He was taken to the hospital, and about, uh, but, but he, he recovered. So that was, that was, that was pretty incredible. Uh, but again, the, the, price of, the price of freedom. This guy here, I like him. He's, uh, uh, he, had a, he borrowed a Swiss passport from a friend of his. And he was going to go over to the east. But he, was gonna, he, he wasn't going to have any train or car or balloon. Or, he's just going to walk right up. And he walked right up, and he wanted to convince the guards that he was a Swiss tourist. So he, he had some Swiss money in his pocket, he had some theater tickets, and he had a Swiss passport. The only thing that didn't occur to him at the time was when they started talking to him. <laughs> and he didn't have very much of a, in fact, he didn't have any kind of a Swiss accent. What did he do? He acted like an arrogant tourist. He was going, huh, like, and they were trying to make conversation with him. He just, um, I mean, what, what's he going to do? But think how nervous this guy really was, because they, they take you off to jail, folks. You spend months, years sometimes in jail. And we're going to, for all these escapes I'm telling you about, there were thousands that weren't successful. So I'm going to talk to you about this, the statistics later on. Finally, these guards, they, they motioned him to uh, customs. And he pulled the same thing with them. Finally, they just said, just let, let him get the hell out of here and just go on. Now, think about this. Now, that's his story. But it could possibly be, there could be a lot of other circumstances here. The guards might have been tired. They might have felt sympathetic for him. They, they could, might not have just been doing their job right. Uh, you know, we don't know the, all the circumstances, but it could, be, there could be, it could have just been luck. But he made it through. And when he made it through, and this was in uh, this was 1961, Yaw was born. And uh, he was over there. And uh, oh, you know what? There was a lot of cool things going on in the West, by the way. You know, what, who, who wouldn't want to go over there when you think about it? Did you know that the Beatles were playing over there in the early 60s? Did you know Elvis was on tour over there? Well, the army. Elvis was on tour in the army. His only European tour. So a lot of cool things were going on. So, so uh, Jochman, he wanted to get some of his friends, families out. So he started planning on digging this tunnel. So he got with some of his uh, other uh, friends, other students. He was a student, engineering student. And they started digging this tunnel. Well, they, they got caught. Uh, so that did, they didn't give up. So they started digging another tunnel. And they went into an old bakery. Uh, now this is just on the, you know, this is, this is close to the wall, but it's in this old bakery. And the guards could, you know, they had to make sure that they weren't seen going in there every day. So I guess they got that worked out. But they're going in there day and night, day and night, day and night. And they dig a tunnel, 475 feet long. And they, at that point, they break through to the other side, get 57 
they were a managed to get 57 other people from, from the east to come through the tunnel. Again, sounds easy, digging a tunnel, walk on through the tunnel, get 57 people, come on. <laughs> Let me tell you what, what this was like. You start digging a tunnel, all right, and the average size of it was about two feet by about 18 inches. And you start going in there and digging, and you're pulling out all this dirt, and the further you go, the darker it's getting and the less air you're breathing. This was a, ultimately, it was a football field and a half long. Yeah, you don't know if you're going to run into some rocks. I mean, Berlin was bombed in 1945, and so you, know, you don't know if there were other walls under there that they were going to bump into, which I'm sure they did. And they're in there, and they're, they're, digging, they're, they're digging this dirt out. So not only do you got to go in through the tunnel, you're digging, but then you got to take the dirt back out. So guess how you come back out? You're back in out with this dirt. And we, earlier today, we, we weighed this, and about a foot, a, a square foot of dirt is about 38 pounds. So you take, you take you know, a couple pounds out at a time, or a couple of uh, square feet out at a time, it's going to add up. So these people were exhausted. Now, I want to give you a little demonstration on, on the, oh, and by the way, the tunnel was zigzagged too a little bit. You know why it was zigzagged? because they haven't yet, as far as I know, invented a bullet that can go around curves. Oh. All right, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a little fun here. That's about the size of the tunnel that they went through. Who thinks they can fit through this? I need somebody out here to try to go through. You, come here. You. Come on up here. We'll come up here. I hope not a All right. Now, I need you two gentlemen. I need you all to come over here and hold the wall up. You, sir, hold it here. You, sir, hold it here. Now, you're going to come in through this direction. Okay. All right. Good. That's a better angle. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. You know, I forgot. I was going to bring in a, I, was, I forgot to bring this in, but it was, uh, it was something that weighed about 38 pounds. <laughs> for her to drag back, but anyway. But wait a minute, let's, I'll tell you what, let's also bring the lights down a little. Yeah, just a Okay, so you're going in through this, and this is about all you have. All right? Okay, now crawl on through. Looking good. All right, here we go. All right, now wait a minute, wait a minute, you're not done. You, you're grabbing your dirt now. I didn't bring the dirt, so you lucked out tonight. <laughs> Now, you got to back back out. <laughs> All right. <Yay>. Lights. <laughs> Thank you, dear. Now, that was Tunnel 57. Now, when they did bust through to the other side, they weren't sure where they were going to come out. They ended up I mean, this is real sheer, sheer luck because they could have they could have come up right there where the where the uh, government was, where the cops were. They could have come up. They didn't know. They didn't have GPS and all this stuff back then. They came up in somewhat of a what was equivalent to a Johnny House. I mean, it was it was really a crappy job, folks. <laughs> but they did it, and then they had to gather up enough people to just make make it seem like a, just a stroll on a Sunday afternoon, just they're walking past here and they ducked in. Went through. 57 of them made it, including uh, this man's girlfriend three years later. And then, uh, but the, they, after about the 57th person, it took about two days, they, the, the government ca caught on to it, and there was a gun battle, and a, 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 a soldier named uh, um, Schultz, he was, he was shot. So anyway, that ended that, but they called it uh, Tunnel 57, which is they still have a marker there today. All right. I don't know how long, I'm just having too much fun, folks. The ADHD is really kicking in right now. So, I'm just, so I don't know if I'm going to get to all these people, but, um, but I'm going to get to several, a few more of my favorites. This guy, he, he practiced and, uh, in the freezing water, Hubert, uh, and he, uh, he practiced for about two years and wanted to get into the, got into the river. <clears throat> now the river, uh, the wall sort of kind of had to 
it, it was kind of odd because you're not going to build a wall on the river, so they had guards watching the river. So he planned at midnight to get into the water with two of his other buddies, and they decided not to go all at once because, uh, you know, it's, it's better, you know, if you don't have a group of people because the less chance you'd be seen as a group. So his two buddies went ahead, and I don't know the fate of them, ex except for that they must have made it or drowned because I don't know, but because when he went, when he went, he made it. And if his other two buddies didn't make it, I'm sure that the guards would have been waiting for him as well. But what he did is he put on the snorkel and he got into the water and uh, he put a, a heavy metal belt on him so that he could kind of weigh him down. And uh, but now he's doing this in, in the pitch blackness. I mean, it was a murky river. He, again, the stories don't tell you about, about the, the, what, what these people went through. Freezing cold, it took him an hour and a half, and he's snorkeling. I don't know how many of y'all snorkel, but that's not real easy unless you, well, I guess this, this guy's practiced it several times, he was c comfortable enough with it. But he's virtually zero visibility, and he looks up every now and again to make sure he's going toward this bridge, and the searchlights are still going across the water, and so he's just sort of like, you know, just he ducks as often as he can, holds his breath. He gets there, gets up on the bridge, and uh, the policeman welcomes him to West Berlin. Uh, I had other uh, stories that I wanted to tell you about, some of, like the train story that I wanted to tell you, but I just don't want to, I don't want to go all night. I'd rather talk about these guys. But I will tell you that as far as escape, escaping, I, I've done the Houdini milk can escape. I've done it several times. Y'all have heard of that, the famous Houdini milk can escape where he, got down into a milk can, handcuffed and shackled, and they put the lid down and they, they chain it. And uh, anyway, just wanted to tell you my experience with being in water, pitch black, but I couldn't resurface in mine. So, so anyway, I'm down there, and it's, a it's actually a very terrifying experience. You have to concentrate. I mean, you really have to concentrate and keep your nerve. But, I, but I've, I've done this, this stunt a few times. This guy, he worked in uh, East Berlin, but he was a West Berliner. And I guess, you know, they had the papers and all that, and so he could, he could come and go. But his girlfriend lived over in East Berlin. He wanted to bring her back. Well, they, they weren't going to let her come back. And he was in love, and he wanted to <laughs> make a life, and, but they wanted to make their life over in the West, you know, you know, the Beatles, Elvis, and all that. <laughs> so he was looking to buy a car. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. He borrowed a friend, uh, a scooter from a friend of his. And he rode, this, you know, he rode this scooter up. And really, the reason he did this is because he wanted to see how tall the scooter is compared to the barrier that went across. All right, so he was kind of making some measurements and some estimates there, and he kind of saw a line there. So he figured out that the, the barrier there was about 35 inches, all right? So, okay, now, so now he's looking for a car to buy over in East Germany. Well, he can't find one, so he rents one. And when he, he rents a small car, and uh, now he gets, he gets his plan, all right, that he's going to get, take his girlfriend and her mother <laughs> in this small little tiny car. I guess they were tiny people. <laughs> but he has to take the windshield off and let the tires out a little bit. So now the car is about 32 inches. That's, that's, that's not very big, folks. <laughs> that's, that's, OK. But now she's hiding under the, uh, you know, where the, the tarp opens up, uh, the, 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 the roof opens up. And she's hiding kind of up under there. Mom is in the trunk with over 30 bricks. The reason the bricks are in there is not to weigh the car down and make it lower, which it did, but in case their plan backfired on them and they start shooting. So the bricks would deflect the, the bullets, hopefully. Anyway, so they were getting a little bit suspicious and they were, they were getting ready to send them to customs. That's when he floored it. And he floored it and he went on under that barrier. Of course, he ducked. And <laughs> they went on through. Uh, as far as I know, there was no shooting, but they say his skid marks were about 96 feet. That's how fast he went. Wolfgang Engels, uh, 
again, some of these stories are a little confusing, and I mean, if some, some of you have more information to add to this, I'd, I'd, I'd welcome that because the story that one of the stories I read is that he had a personal personnel ar armored vehicle, and another one said he had a tank. <laughs> so I don't know, you know, they had fake news back then too, I guess, but uh, he was a soldier, and he was um, um, wanting to escape. Uh, to, to, the, to the west, and he was pals with these other soldiers, and he, he drove around in his vehicle, whatever that was, but these other guys, they had this tank, you know, you know, personnel carrier, armored vehicle, or whatever, and so they became buddies, you know, smoked their cigarettes and talked a little bit, and he let them ride his vehicle around, and they showed him how his vehicle worked, and so, uh, I mean, so after these soldiers went to lunch, he got in their vehicle and decided he was going to take a stroll right through the wall. But before he went, he invited a few other, I guess, bystanders to get in with him. And uh, no, 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 no. It was a really crazy idea. Like, how are you going to do this? I'm going to go through the wall. So anyway, well, he hit the wall pretty hard, but he didn't quite break through to the other side. And of course, I mean, these, these guards were on him like hornets. He, what, did, what can he do? He jumped out of the vehicle as fast as he could, climbed up on top of it, started jumping up onto the wall, which was maybe about 12 feet tall, 10, 12 feet tall. And uh, he got caught in the barbed wire, he got shot twice. But that didn't kill him. And he was determined, and he was hooting and hollering, and there were some people over in a bar over on the west side heard him. They went over and formed a human chain, and they lowered him down and brought him to freedom. So, and he, it, he recovered. Um, while I'm doing this talk, uh, one of our wonderful guests brought me something very special. And I'm, you know what I'm going to do? I, while I'm talking here, I'm going to pass this around. And... piece of the wall. This is actually a piece of the top of the wall that they went over, kind of curved. We only feel that maybe it was curved because maybe it was the rain and all that. So I'm going to start here. Y'all can pass along a piece of history and while I'm doing some more talking. Mark, let's have five minutes more of the presentation and ten minutes for questions. Okay, okay, five more minutes. Okay, all right. Let me, let me, let me pick out Okay, uh, there was, uh, uh, very quickly, I'm going I'm to try to speed these up. Um, these people were, Ingrid and her, uh, well this wasn't, yeah, these people were in love. You know what love does, funny things to you. They tried to escape. They went up to Poland to get papers. They weren't successful, so they were afraid to come back, so they decided to buy a toy gun get on a plane. I guess it was a lot easier to get on a plane with uh, any kind of gun back in those. I remember you could smoke on a plane, but anyway, these, these were different times. So they, they hijacked the plane and landed in West Berlin. So that's a quick story on that one. Uh, I, not something I'd advise for uh, everybody to do. They did, pay, they did do some time in jail for that because it was breaking international law, but uh, n not what you'd think. So they, they were out after a few months. Um, Peter Dobler is another swimmer. He swam the Baltic Sea. He was in the, he was in the, uh, he was in the sea for um, 24 hours. You know what it's like to be in water for 24 hours? You know what it's like, Dr. Wright? Have you seen people? I mean, you get in the water. But this guy, he was prepared. He used to be a physician himself. But he had nothing to hold him in East Germany because he couldn't advance with his medical career. His, uh, his wife had left him. What did he have, you know? And of course, when your wife leaves you, you know, you're like, what, do I, what am I going to do now? I've, I ha I've had that happen before. Fortunately, I've got a second wife that's great. <laughs> my first wife, this wife is Sherry. My first wife's name was Sherry. You know, you know what the, the problem with, the problem with being married to Sherry's, well, well, I, I, I don't know if I should go there. She's kind of looking at me. <laughs> but I will say, at least I didn't have to change the towels or the tattoo. <laughs> This guy made it, and uh, 
but he took along with him some chocolate, some, uh, some appetite suppressors, uh, and the appetite suppressor, by the way, worked like ecstasy. It's a drug, ecstasy. All right, ecstasy, I don't know if y'all are familiar with this, but you take ecstasy, you're, you know, everything, is, everything is beautiful. You see a guard, hey, you're beautiful, you know, <laughs> wrap your hands around. So, don't ask me how I know. <laughs> anyway, all right, so, um, uh, all right, so I, I would love to go on and on and some more, but I do have one more uh, uh, escape that I'd like to do for you here before we do close this out, but I just want to sum this up with this. Uh, for every escape there was, there were thousands that failed. Over almost 30 years, 300 people escaped. There's 100 people in this room. Multiply this by three. I told this to a lady earlier today. She was going, wow. Think about that, though. Almost 30 years, that's less than 10 people a year. 100 people tried and got killed. 250,000 people attempted and didn't make it. So we're talking about a small, small fracture of these people. And this is important, folks. This is important that we, you know, I was, at first I was going to say, but this guy did this, this guy did that. But I wanted to say their names. Because, you know, to fight for freedom, this is what we're supposed to do every day here in the United States. And we take advantage of that. I mean, every year I go over here to this Memorial Day and this Veteran Day thing. I was never in the military. But you know what? These people fought for our freedoms. I, I, I appreciate that so much. And I'm thinking, what can I do to show appreciation? At least I can show up. And at least I can try to make the world a better place through my gifts and my talents, which is something that we're all supposed to do. Because folks, I can't think of anything better in this world than helping somebody else. I really can't. So folks, there's a lot of walls that we hit, all right? A lot of walls that we go through. We're all Americans. I don't think of us as, as uh, Native Americans or African Americans or Chinese Americans. To me, that, that could be considered some form of, of, of racism by you separating people like that. You know why? Because we're all Americans. And together, we can knock down any wall. Thank you. I just can't let this go and part of me in this whole uh, evening without me giving you one last okay. Hopefully this will work a little bit better than the first one. All right. Now, I got my daughter here. She's, she's tying me up. But you know what? She, you might think she's gimmicking. This no thing. tricks up my sleeve. All right, here. I need, <laughs> she's, she, she just kind of got started. I need somebody to kind of finish this out. Somebody come on up here and finish this out. Can somebody go ahead and get me tied up? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, that's all about the Oh, yeah. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Now, what, what, what you come up there, sir? Uh, what we're going to do this first. We're gonna, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. We're going to do this first. Now I need you to. Hold on. Just make real tight. Got in there. Now this is this is this is a little tricky here. This one here, you have to reach. Wait, hold on, hold on. Uh, this is the only time you ever see me swing both ways, folks. Now, here, when I swing, there you go. You must have done this before. Yeah. There you go. Good luck. Okay. So I need to time this.
Those guards, Doc. 